Hello everybody, it's me Dave Tong, the Yarnsmith of Norwich and welcome back to this the second part of my medieval midwinter set. Just as with the first part, you find me starting my session in front of my medieval hanging, covered with pictures from long, long, long ago. Although as you'll know, if you watched the first part of my session, well, we are interested in this fella, right there, Sir Clevis. There he is, look in his castle. He is surveying his estates, but as you heard in the first part of my story, he is no mean man, he is no cruel lord. He was a wise and generous knight who gave to everybody, his friends, his family, his vassals, the hard-working people who lived upon his estates. But so generous was he that he was made poor by his own desire, and so Sir Cleed, well as my story started, he was desperate. But as you heard tell in the first part of my session, well, he enjoyed a Christmas miracle. He was gifted some Christmas cherries, fresh grown in the middle of winter, and a cool and hard winter at that. Cherries as big as my fist, I kid you not, they were that big. He shared them with all of his people. As you heard tell, he then went on a journey to take some of those cherries to his friend and master of old, King Uther Pendragon. And of course he met many folk upon the road who were in need, and so willingly he swapped some of those cherries for some of their stories. And as the first part of my session ended, it found Sir Cleage resting in an inn. And it was a well-earned rest. Because, of course, his road had been hard. It was rutted by horse hoof and cartwheel. It was full of puddles filled with ice and melting snow. It had been but a muddy track, a perilous path in places, made worse by the fact that it was the middle of winter, and a cool and hard winter at that, when snow lay upon snow lay upon snow. As you will have heard tell in the first part of my session, it was the leanest of winters. When Mother Winter, she wrapped herself around the land like an icy cloak, her long, bitter fingers reaching inside one and all, tickling their ribs, chilling them to the bone. And you wouldn't want that, would you? But the fire is burning brightly in the hearth, and full from feasting you draw ever closer towards its beckoning flames. The sweet, fragrant wood smoke... Filling your nostrils and putting you at your ease as the storyteller begins to tell his tale. Sir Cleage, he slept soundly that night, dreaming of a Christmas at his own castle. But he dreamt of roaring fires in his many halves. He dreamt of family and friends. He dreamt of dancing, singing, laughter and joy. But he dreamt of a riotous and merry din. <laughs> But when at last Sir Cleage awoke, all was silent. His room was bathed only in the dim light of the moon as it played upon the frost-covered window panes. And Sir Cleage's belly barked loudly. 
For all he'd eaten this past many days were cherries, and now he hankered for some meat. He went downstairs and called for the innkeeper, but no reply came. For the hour was late, the candles had been snuffed out, the fire was burning low. And Sir Cleed, he was alone, save only for a strange stranger who sat hunkering by the dying embers of the fire. A strange stranger indeed, for when he thought about it later, Sir Cleed, he could remember no detail of the man, save only that he wore a dark cloak and a dark hood which covered his face. And Sir Cleed, he perceived him to be a man of many faces, a man who could blend into his surroundings, a man who could disappear in the clap of a hand. Perhaps for old Sir Cleed, a ragged rogue, going about his bad business. But still welcome company during this, the most cruel of seasons, during this, the most bitterest of nights. And so it was, old Sir Cleed, he banked up the fire. He offered the strange stranger some cherries, if he would but share a tale. The strange stranger winking his approval, saying that yes, he would. Artery chomped on some of those cherries. And know, my friends, that this is the tale he told. Once, long ago, there was a trickster. A beguiler of the foolish, a coney-catching, cunning man. And try saying that when you've had too much Christmas ale to drink. No, my friends, that he travelled from town to town, village to village, house to house, wearing many different disguises. Sometimes a priest, sometimes a potter, sometimes a peddler of wares. But on this occasion, on this day, he arrived at a certain time disguised as a scholar, a clever student of long ago. He went abroad about the town, boasting that he was the most learned lad in the land, and that none, none could match his wit, for that he was well schooled in alchemy, astrology, and even astronomy. Well, such were his boasts, they reached the ears of the Chancellor, who was in charge of the university, where all the wisest men did dwell. Quite where all the wise women dwelt, I cannot say, for there was not enough room at one university. For all of them. Well, the Chancellor was a man who considered himself to be very learned, but he believed only those things that you could read in books, stuff that had been written by men in togas and sandals long ago. Anything else was just fake news. He didn't like the boasts of this, this new student in town, and so it was he sent his messenger, his herald, to him to say that he wished to perform a test. The following day, the herald arrived at the trickster's lodgings and told him that his master wished to tell him, no, this, to test him even, that would be even better, wouldn't it? I've had some of that Christmas ale, you see. He said, if you can answer three questions set by my master, the chancellor, then he shall reward you with 100 gold coins. But, said the herald, but, said he, if you cannot answer but one of those questions, then you shall be whipped through the streets of this town. Well, it's fair to say that a lesser trickster would have turned on his heels and fled. But not our beguiler of the foolish. For the following day he arrived at the university disguised in scholar's cap and gown. He bowed low to all of the other students gathered there, fair and fine folk like all of you. He bowed low to the Chancellor of the University. Well, that great man, or that's what he thought he was anyway, he wasted no time asking his first question. He said, Tell me, tell me if you can, tell me what I am thinking. Well, our coney catching cunning man, he smiled broadly, for the answer was easy. He stepped forward and said, You are thinking that you are more clever than me. Know that all of the other students gathered there laughed loudly, although the Chancellor did not. For the trickster spoke true, he could not argue with that. And so it was he wasted no time asking his second question, hoping that the sham student would not get the better of him again. Tell me, says he, tell me if you can, 
Tell me how many hairs are there in my big bushy beard? Abigail of the foolish smiled broadly, for the answer was easy. Stepping forward, he plucked one of the hairs. That was a very loud hair pluck, as you could hear. From plucked one of those hairs, moving on very quickly, plucked one of the hairs from the Chancellor's chubby chin. And he said, there is exactly one less hair now than there was a moment ago. Know that all of the other scholars gathered there, they all laughed loudly, although the Chancellor did not. That was my post, by the way, Christmas cards. The Chancellor did not, for the trickster spoke true. He could not argue with that. And so it was the Chancellor. He wasted even less time asking his third question in the hope that the mock master was not that clever after all. Tell me, says he, tell me if you can, tell me how many stars there are in the night sky. What a question, such a question. Who could answer such a question, especially long, long ago, before there was Google and the like? But know this, our trickster smiled broadly, for the answer was easy. But stepping forward, he pointed to a bearskin rug that lay in front of the Chancellor's throne. He said, there are exactly the same amount of stars in the heavens as there are hairs in that rug. But this time the other students did laugh. For the Chancellor, red-faced and roaring, roaring with rage, he leapt from his throne and he said, how, how can you possibly know that? For a moment, the smile left the trickster's face, as if he was perhaps pondering upon the Chancellor's wicked whip. But then he smiled broadly again, and stepping forward he said, My Lord, forgive me, for I forgot that last night while I walked abroad around your beautiful city, I saw a shooting star fall, fall, falling from the sky. He plucked another hair. Except this time, not from the Chancellor's chin, but from the bearskin rug. And he said, now, now there are exactly the same amount of stars in the heaven as there are hairs in that rug. All of the other scholars laughed loudly, although the Chancellor did not. For he was too lazy to count the stars or the hairs in that rug, too mean to pay someone else to do it. And yet he did have to part with some of his gold that day. For know, my friends, that our trickster, our beguiler of the foolish, our coney-catching cunning man he left, weighed down with his own wit and wisdom, but also with 100 gold coins. I hope you enjoyed that tale. I know Sir Cleves did. But before he could speak, before he could offer the strange stranger any of his cherries, a voice broke through the silence, through the darkness. A beguiler of the foolish indeed. Although know that even his wit and wisdom is no match for the guile of a woman. And now peering into the darkness, Sir Cleed saw an old knight much like himself sitting at the far end of the inn. He had arrived late, there was no bed for him this night. And so there he sat, still clad in his armour, stained with rust, mud and blood. For he too was on a quest that he feared would never end. His only solace came in meeting men of like status, like old Sir Cleage, of talking with them of this, that and the other, of putting the world to rights, of telling stories, and perhaps even sharing some of those miraculous midwinter cherries. A beguiler of the foolish indeed, says he, although this time by way of an introduction to a story. And this is the story he told. Once, long ago, there was a wise and clever queen, whose name is now lost to time. But I can tell you that she was as fair as a May morning. And even though her husband was a king of great renown, still many other men desired her, even the foremost and finest of his many knights. 
But there was another less noble lord, who also lusted after the queen, a cruel lord from a faraway land. For some said that he was a dark wizard who wore dark magic about him as you or I might wear a cloak to keep out the worst of Mother Winter's wicked winds. Others whispered that he was no mortal, that he was no man but born of the elves. While some said that the sun never shone upon his realm, that it was a dim, dull, unhappy place where only misery and woe grew through the cold, frozen earth. Whatever the truth of it, the cruel lord wanted the fair woman for his own, and so it was he stole her away, quickly taking her back to his own land. Red-faced and roaring, her husband the king gave chase, accompanied by the foremost and finest of his many knights, they made up his mighty war band. They rode out over high hill and low dale. They rode without care between the gnarled and knotted trees, only slowing when they had need to hack and cut their way through the cruel and twisted thorns that lay beyond. On and on they rode, sleeping out each night beneath the stars, sleeping upon the cold bare rocks. Cruel mattresses even for brave knights such as they. On and on they rode, whilst carrion crow and other bedraggled birds perched above their heads and piped piteously as they passed by. On and on they rode, past lakes that were as black as blood upon a moonless night. On and on and on they rode, until finally they arrived at the cruel lord's cruel land. They arrived at his castle set high upon the cruel rocks. The king dismounted his horse. He walked forward. He drew his sword and called up to the cruel lord. He said, You, you have taken my wife, and so now I shall take your life. If you are brave enough to face me, just you and I, man to man. But the cruel lord laughed. For being a cruel man, he was also a coward. He had no intention of facing the king himself. And so it was he sent one of his own warriors out to fight in his stead. And now it was a wicked warrior, a wild warrior even, who wielded an even wickeder weapon. For it was a sword, a sword as tall as a man. Imagine that, as he and the king did battle. Their swords clashed, their shields smashed throughout that day and the following night, whilst their armour, it glistened with each other's blood. The cruel lord had hoped for an easy victory, but seeing now that not even the best of his knights could best the king, he began to fear for his own life. And so it was he called the wise and generous queen his hostage forward in the hope that she would speak wise and generous words and so save his flesh. The woman stepped forward and this is what she said. Since my husband and his enemy have fought so hard to have me, then have me both shall. For one, he shall be my husband when the leaves lie heavy upon the boughs, the other when they do not. Well, quickly, in great haste, the Lord, the cruel Lord, he claimed the woman when the the trees were bare. For he could think only of winter, that harsh and cruel time where he could keep warm with her beneath the sheets of his bed. But he spoke in great haste indeed, for he forgot, he forgot that some trees like the holly and others that are covered in ivy, they never lose their leaves. He forgot that at this time of year we bring their boughs into the house to remind us that even the cruelest of seasons, the leanest of winters, will finally come to an end. And because he spoke in haste, he lost that which he desired most. For the queen, she was happy to go back to her husband, be content to be his loving wife. While, of course, the king, he would be happy to be her loving husband. Another good story from long ago, I think you'll agree. And know this. Although Sir Cleage heard many, many stories on that journey during the cruelest of seasons long ago, I think it's fair to say that he enjoyed the two he heard at the end from that man with many faces, from the old knight, most of all. Because both of them appealed to his own wit and wisdom. 
Our wit and wisdom that had served him well in times past. Our wit and wisdom that would serve him just one more time before this tale is at an end. He thanked both men for their stories. He went to gift both of them some more cherries. But the strange stranger had already disappeared. And so it was time for old Sir Cleese to disappear, to continue on his journey. He walked out into the cold, clear, crisp early morning light. And as he did, he marvelled at how even the darkest of seasons could yet still be so beautiful. How even the leanest of winters could still nourish a man's soul. As old Sir Cleage, he continued on his quest. <laughs> long. It was rutted by horse hoof and cartwheel, full of puddles filled with ice and melting snow. It was but a muddy track, a perilous path in places that began to take its toll upon old Sir Cleage. But he was forced to walk many more days with little food and little rest, until finally his legs began to buckle beneath him, and he was forced to sleep upon the cold bare rocks, most certainly the cruelest of mattresses for one as ancient as he. And yet still old Sir Cleage, he slept soundly enough until he was rudely awoken by a likely lad passing by. The young man shook him roughly. He was a dullard, although I should say he spoke gently enough, for he asked old Sir Cleage what ailed him, saying that he would set him upon his donkey, a bewildered beast that stood shivering in the snow nearby, and that he would take old Sir Cleage to a doctor of physic of his acquaintance, a wondrous clever man who could perform many miracles. Oh no that Sir Cleage, he would have slept more if he could. But alas, the wittard witted on, and this is what he said. Once there was a doctor who was fine at his work. There were none as skilled, none as good as their trade as this doctor of physic. For know that he could cure boils on your belly, boils on your back, and even boils and burns on your bare backside, if you got too close to the fire anyway. None could match his skill at medicine. And such was his fame, that people travelled from far and near, merchants and mayors, lords and ladies, all of them, seeking his advice. But on this day, on this occasion, a young man came to see him, a poor, lusty fellow. There was nothing wrong with him. He was tall and strong. If there was anything wrong with him at all, it was simply that he was an idle lad. He had lost his donkey and he was too lazy to look for it himself. And so it was, he said to all of his friends, If that doctor is sage enough to cure the sick, then he must be learned enough to find that which is lost. 
He arrived at the Doctor of Physics' great house. He went inside, only to find him already surrounded by lords and ladies, merchants and mayors, all waving their purses in the air, all calling out loudly, demanding that the Doctor of Physics see to cure them, curing them first. But the poor young man, he didn't want to wait. He had a donkey to fight. He barged his way through the crowd. He called out loudly of the missing beast, asking the doctor of physics help. But such was the din from the chinking purses. Everyone calling out at once. The doctor could not hear what the poor young man was saying. And seeing that he was a ragged lad with only a few pennies to pay for his medicine, well... The doctor gave that poor young man his cheapest brew. It was a foul-smelling green liquid held within a glass bottle. He told him to drink it straight up and be gone. Knowing, knowing that the doctor was master of his craft, that poor young man did exactly as he was bidden, even though the, the medicine it tasted far, far worse than it smelled. He swallowed it down, he cast down the bottle and walked away, only wondering how the medicine would help. Well, it's now, my friends, that I'm going to give you a brief history lesson. Don't worry, it's not too long. Doctors of medicine, they could cure you in many ways, or that's what they said. They might stare at your urine in a glass vessel and go, ooh, and ah, as if they knew what they were talking about. They might hold feathers up to your nose to drive the bad humours, the bad illness away. Either that or they might purge you. Now that meant that they might nick a vein in your arm, letting some of your blood drip, drip, drip into a bowl held for the purpose. Or maybe they would give you one of those foul-smelling medicines. Perhaps it's the green one. Well, it would be the job of that medicine to bring up bleh, all the bad things within you, within you even, or even make them go down. You know what I speak, do you not? For that poor young man, he hadn't gone far. When his belly began to rumble, it began to grumble and groan. No sooner did he run into the, the vegetation, the shrubbery nearby, let's say. No sooner did he pull down his medieval hose, his much-mended medieval trousers, than he let a long, a loud and lusty fart. Now, in truth, my friends, some farts are quite quiet, quite civilised. They sound like vicars or even bees sneezing. But this was a rasping, roaring, ripe fart that rose up at the end. And you know what? It sounded more like a donkey braying, more like a donkey calling out than it did a woeful wind. Now at this point I'm sure some of you are with me or even ahead of me. For no sooner did he finish his fart than that poor young man he heard his own donkey calling out loudly. For it having heard its master's fart, believing it to be another donkey nearby, it came close. The poor young man, he took up his donkey with a rope around the neck. He led it home, only stopping on the route home to tell all who would listen that that doctor of physics truly was a marvellous and miraculous man. For not only could he cure you of boils on your belly, boils on your back and even boils and burns on your bare backside, he could also find things that were lost. Unusual, that tale, I think you'll agree. Although saying that, you know what? Medieval times, there were lots of fart stories, all designed to make you laugh. And make old Sir Cleeds laugh, it did. And after hearing it, he was in no need of that doctor anymore. That young man's story was the only physic he needed as he continued on his quest. <laughs>
the road was long and rutted by horses and cartwheel, full of puddles filled with ice and melting snow. It was but a muddy track, a perilous path in places, and old Sir Cleed he met many in peril. People, poor folk, going hungry, and winningly he swapped many more of his miraculous midwinter cherries for their stories. Now some of those tales were merry jests, jokey stories, just like the fart tale you've heard tell. Others were more thoughtful, miracle tales. Some, though, were melancholic, sad stories. For after all, what other sort of story would you expect to hear from he who did labour where only dead folk do dwell, the grave digger? For it was he that Sir Cleed he met now working in a churchyard not that far from King Uther's castle. There he was labouring in the earth, but he was bemoaning his lot in life, bewailing his lot. He was cursing the would-be occupant of this grave, and indeed anyone else for that matter, who was selfish enough to die in the middle of a cruel and hard winter, when the cold frozen earth would not easily yield to the edge of his spade. Hearing his moans, Sir Cleese went into the graveyard. He helped the grave digger out of his hole. He gifted him some of the cherries. And now the two old men, they talked of this, they talked of that, they even talked of the other. Until finally, old Sir Cleage asked the grave digger the very same question that most of us would ask him if we had been there that day. Tell me, my friend, have you ever seen anything strange? Have you ever seen anything weird as you've been busy about your business amongst the bones? The old grave digger, he smiled a knowing smile. He laughed a knowing laugh. For this was a question he'd oft times been asked, and always his answer was the same. Oh no, sir, not I, sir, but I can tell you of an old knight, much like yourself, who saw much worse, not far from here, and not that long ago. And this, my friends, this is the story that the old grave digger told. A tale for Christmas, for it is a ghost tale. Once, once there was a lady, a beautiful young woman, who was as fair as she was foul. For she was as ugly within as air she was without. Her skin was as white as morning milk and as bright as a newly minted koi. Her hair was blonde, the colour of the brightest summer sun upon the brightest summer day, and it was long, so, so very long, but not as long as the long list of abuses that she inflicted upon her vassals, the hungry and thirsty peasants who toiled hard, who broke their backs upon her land, for she was a cruel mistress. She was a lazy, vain woman, and she was a miser. She kept all of her coin for herself. If any of you watching my tales this day had come knocking on her door, begging for alms, begging for food, begging for coin, she would have said, Get ye gone! Tarry here no more! For that's how they talked long ago. She kept all of her money to herself, not wanting to share it with anyone. Only her family, and even they, didn't get as much as they wanted. Well, so mean, so vicious was that woman, she wouldn't even light her fire in winter. So cold was her house that eventually she caught a chill. And now she lay dying. There she lay upon her deathbed, tossing and turning, moaning and groaning, wailing and weeping, until suddenly she awoke, wild-eyed and weary. She called her family to her. She promised them she would tell them all where her gold was hidden, that they could have all of it. As long as they did promise, as long as they swore upon their lives, that they would bury her in a brand new pair of shoes. More correctly, a pair of stout boots, more suited to a yeoman farmer than a high-born noble lady such as she. Well, having made her family swear, the woman died. She went up, oh, and that she was gone. And the following day she was buried, deep in that cold, dank earth, her feet wrapped in shiny new leather. But that night, 
the night of the day that they buried the miserly lady. An old knight was returning home from the hunt when he heard screaming in the woods in front of him and he saw the miserly woman running towards him dressed only in a white shift, a simple white gown in those new boots but now they were covered in dirt. She was bleeding, her clothes tattered as she scrabbled to get away desperately from some hounds that were barking and baying behind her and behind them came a heinous and horrifying horse for riding upon the horse was the devil himself after the miserly woman. She was screaming, she was terrified. The knight, being a good knight, being a kind and courteous man, he took hold of her, trying to rescue her, holding her with his left hand whilst he drew his sword with the right, desperately trying to defend her. Well, such were her struggles. He wrapped her long blonde hair around his left hand, trying to hold her as she fought to get free. But such was that woman's fear, that if all the leaves on all the trees in all the land were to become as tongues this night, still, still there would not be enough to speak of her terror. Such was her fear that she broke free, leaving a shank of her long blonde hair hanging upon the knight's arm. She ran screaming into the darkness, closely followed by the devil upon his heinous and horrifying horse. He snatched her up by what was left of her blonde hair, casting her over the front of his horse, riding with her screaming into the darkness. What a sight. The knight had never seen the like. As soon as he arrived back in town, he told everyone in the local alehouse, his own haunt, what he had seen. But they all laughed at him, saying nonsense, for the woman they described was the miserly lady who had died and been buried that day. It could not have been her. Once more they mocked her, saying that he should have another drink to go with the many that he'd obviously already enjoyed. But being a knight, a noble lord, he didn't like being mocked. He wished to prove that he was right. It couldn't have been her who had died. She couldn't have been buried. And he meant to prove it. He went to the graveyard. He hung a lantern upon a twisted tree, casting light, just enough light for him to see as he dug, dug, dug at the miserly woman's grave, eventually reaching her coffin. Uncovering the lid, he lifted it. Now, I'm sure many of you know what must be done. If you were here for my first session, well, we can't be that interactive online, but I did get you to do a crow last time, and I'm sure it was pretty good. This time, I want you all to do a creaky lid, and know, my friends, there's no more creaky lid than a coffin lid. After three, one, two, three. Yeah, keep it going now. It's quite big, this coffin lid. It's very big. The coffin lid was open. And there, to his surprise, lay the miserly woman. A look of horror upon her face. And now she lay there with much of her blonde hair missing. Her shift, her gown was tattered and torn. And her boots, those brand new leather boots, were scratched and scuffed. And they were covered in mud and blood. Make of that what you will, my friends. But know this, old Sir Cleage enjoyed that story immensely. Some of you might be thinking, well, it's not nice to enjoy the suffering of others. But I will say that perhaps she was a miser, perhaps she was mean enough that, that she deserved it. Certainly old Sir Cleage, being a generous man, he didn't like to see greed like hers. Although know this, my friends, he would find out that there was greed in the real world and not just in stories before this tale is done. As old Sir Cleage, he continued on his quest. <laughs>
the road was long. It was rutted by horse hoof and cartwheel, full of puddles filled with ice and melting snow. It was but a muddy track, a perilous path in places, and so hard was the journey that now it was etched upon poor old Sir Cleege's lined and haggard face. And in his worn garb and tired apparel that he'd put on for the journey, he looked more like a poor peasant than the noble knight that you and I know him to have been as finally he arrived at Uther Pendragon's castle. He beat upon the door of the Bailey Gate, the first of many gates that pierced the ramparts of earth at stone that surrounded Uther Pendragon's great stone keep. He beat upon that door with his staff until finally a small door above <coughs> opened and out looked the king's steward. A greedy man, who looking down and seeing only a poor beggar, who clearly had nothing to offer him, he threatened to cut off old Sir Cleese's ears if he did not leave. Be off with your vile villain, says he. You will find no comfort here. And so it was old Sir Cleese he was forced to uncover the basket of miraculous midwinter cherries, so that the steward could see the gift he had brought the king. And when that jealous man looked upon the gift, he couldn't believe his eyes. Fresh grown in the middle of winter, and a cruel and hard winter of that. He thought, for such a wonderful gift, the king is sure to reward this old man. And so it was he let old Sir Cleage pass through the gate, but only if he agreed to give the steward one third, one third of any reward that the king granted unto him. And old Sir Cleegy had no choice to agree, even though it meant that he would only now get two-thirds, two-thirds of any reward. But he was a noble knight. He would keep his temper as he continued towards another gate that stood at the bottom of the great stone steps that led up to King Uther Pendragon's great stone keep. Once again, old Sir Cleage beat upon the wooden door with his staff. He continued beating until a door above opened. <coughs> And out looked the king's constable, who, seeing an old man standing there, who clearly had nothing to offer him, he threatened to slit old Sir Cleage's nose if he did not go. Be off with your ragged rascal, says he. You will find no comfort here. And so old Sir Cleage, once again, he was forced to uncover the basket so that the constable might see the gift he had brought the king. And when the constable looked upon those miraculous midwinter cherries, fresh grown in the middle of a cruel and hard winter of that, he couldn't believe his eyes. He thought for such a wonderful gift, the king is sure to give this old man an equally wonderful reward. And so he let him pass by to continue up the stone steps. But only if old Sir Cleage agreed to give him one third, one third of any reward that the king granted unto him. And old Sir Cleage, well, he was forced to agree. Even meant, it now meant that he was only going to get. You didn't know you were going to have to do maths, did you? But it was one third left. He would keep his temper, though, for he was a noble knight as he climbed that stone case, stair stone case. Stone case, is that a word it is now? As he climbed up to the top of the keep, where he came across one more great oaken door between him and the king. Again, old Sir Cleage beat hard upon the door of his staff until finally a little door above was opened and there was the king's porter looking down. And seeing an old beggar who clearly had nothing to offer him, he threatened to cut off old Sir Cleage's ears if he did not go away. Be off with your scabby scoundrel, says he. You will find no comfort here. For a third and final time, old Sir Cleage was forced to uncover the basket of miraculous midwinter cherries so that the porter could see the gift he had brought the king. And when that envious porter, he looked down, he saw that gift. He couldn't believe his eyes. Cherries, fresh grown in the middle of winter and a cruel and hard winter at that. He thought, for such a wonderful gift. The king is sure to reward this old beggar, give him something equally wonderful. And so it was, he let old Sir Cleage pass, but only, only if he agreed to give the porter one third, 
One third of any reward that the king granted unto him. And of course, old Tocleet, if he wanted to get into the keep, he had no choice to agree. Even though it meant he would get nothing. No, not a sausage. But he would keep his temper. He was a noble knight as he walked into Uther's keep. And there was King Uther Pendragon, old but wiser, sitting upon his throne, surrounded by his rich courtiers. Well, the road had been long, rutted by horse hoof and cartwheel, full of puddles filled with ice and melting snow, a muddy track of perilous path. It was etched, that journey was, upon the old man's face, so much so that even King Uther Pendragon didn't recognise his friend of old, Sir Cleage. But still he dealt him much more kindness, treated him more finely than his servants had done, especially when, when Sir Cleage offered up the gift of the miraculous midwinter cherries. The king had never seen the like, fresh grown in the middle of winter. Not only that, they were cherries the size of my fist, I kid you not. They were that big. Well, so pleased was the king, he offered old Sir Cleage a reward. Whatever you want in this world, says he, it shall be yours. For know that Uther was a very dramatic king. And at this point, joking aside, I must ask all of you, what should Sir Cleage, Sir Cleage choose, given that he must share it all out with the envious, covetous, jealous men? What should he pick? What would you pick? Well, remember at the start of the story, not today, but in the first part, I introduced Sir Cleage as being wise and generous. And know, my friends, that I spoke true, for this is what he said. My Lord Uther, says he, Sire, all I ask from you is twelve blows, twelve knocks, twelve strikes with this my own staff. The king was surprised. It, it wasn't much of a reward. But being a king, swearing upon his kingship that he would offer this old man a reward, he was forced to agree. Unwillingly, Sir Cleese took that reward. Unwillingly, he shared it out amongst the steward, the constable, the porter. Four, that's it, four whopping wax each. Well, that's near the end of my story, except to say King Uther was watching as old Sir Cleage dealt out the blows of his staff to those greedy servants. And as he watched, he recognised something in the old man's actions. Finally, he realised it was his friend, Sir Cleage. Hearing how badly the servants had treated him, seeing how well he had dealt them their blows, well, the king, he rewarded Sir Cleage with gold, silver, jewels, fair and fine things, food to take back to his family, friends and his people. He invited old Sir Cleage to stay out the rest of winter until spring before he returned home, which old Sir Cleage did. And finally he left with great wagon loads of treasure to take home. But even though it was spring, the road was long. It was rutted by horse hoof and cartwheel, not filled with ice or melting snow, but still hard work. So hard was the journey that finally, when he returned home to his family and friends, he greeted them warmly. He kissed his wife, his children. But he was too tired to tell the story that I've just told you in two parts. And so he said only this. He said, the cherries were fair, and so knocked from the trees. The king's servants were foul, and so knocked to their knees. Thank you for listening to my tales, and fare thee all well.